book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 16. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Amen. Yeah, ha, 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 read there. And it says here, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray this word edifies and lifts up, Lord, and restores the loss and brings confidence back uh, to the ones who served you, Lord. That helps the backslider return, Father, that gives strength to those who are worrying, Father, in this time. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. The title of my message today is The Road to Emmaus. Now, these two were disciples. That were walking down this road to Emmaus. They're not the first original 12, but the 70 appointed by Jesus himself in Luke 10. Followers and professed believers of our Lord. They are walking and talking about all the events that had happened to Jesus. The persecution, the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and now waiting for proof of the resurrection. They had left Jerusalem because of what had happened to Jesus. And because it was the third day and had not seen him, they are doubting everything Jesus has said and taught. The road to Emmaus is the road to obscurities. Emmaus, the village that they were going to means obscure, uncertain, or unclear. They left Jerusalem, which means vision of peace, to go to Emmaus, which means unclear. They left where they had peace because they saw what happened to go to somewhere with uncertainties, where it's unclear, where it's uncertain. They left where they had security, where they had peace, Jerusalem. They let the current situation Strip them of their peace and send them down a road of uncertainty. Let's bring this up to date. Let's bring this to 2020. I know a lot of people have lost their peace with what is going on with this coronavirus. They've seen how this virus has literally put the whole world in a standstill. Every time you turn on the television, you're bombarded with death death tolls, and people testing positive results. Restrictions and limits on how and when to see loved ones, even if they allow you to. Border patrols to prevent people from crossing from city to city. And you ask yourself, God, where are you? Why can't I see you? Why is this happening? So now you're on the road to Emmaus, the road to uncertainty. The unclear path, the I don't know when, where, or how I'm going to make it road. Uncertainty brings doubt. Doubt brings fear, and fear brings chaos. I'm going to say that to you again. Uncertainty brings doubt. Doubt brings fear, and fear brings chaos. But in the middle of all the chaos and all your doubts. Let's read verse 15 again. It says, so it was. While they conversed and reasoned. While you were talking about the virus. While you were reading the statistics of how many people have died. While you were reading all the positive results in New York and in New Jersey. How they mentioned that North Newark was the highest casualty of positive corona cases. You we're talking about the results. And then it says that Jesus himself drew near and went with him. Your doubt, your fears cannot keep Jesus away. These two disciples who left Jerusalem 
because of what happened to Jesus. And Jesus has said that on the third day, I would resurrect. And they were waiting. Where is Jesus? Where is that promise? They felt that they were like left. Well, I guess it ain't going to come to pass. So let's go. And it's funny that they were going to Emmaus because Emmaus means, Emmaus means uncertainty. And this virus has caused and put people in a place of uncertainty. They don't know when their next meal is going to come. They don't know when their next paycheck is going to come. They don't know if they're going to see tomorrow. They haven't seen their loved ones in a while. They don't know. Some people are even committing suicide because of this lock-in because they don't know how to handle it. They've let the coronavirus steal their peace. You see, for these two to leave, it's one thing if they left because they never knew Jesus, but it's another thing for them to leave and they were disciples. You see, in Luke chapter 10, these two were the 70 that were chosen personally by Jesus. So he knew them and they knew him. And a lot of, and the Bible says that at the end times, a lot of saints will fall. So I'm here today. I believe God gave me a word to encourage you. That even though you're in the Lord, where are you? Lord, am I wanted, what I'm going to do? Like verse 15 said, he walked up to them. And as we continue to read, he walked with them to Emmaus. Oh, he, he accompanied you to your doubt, through your doubt, through your de de depression, through your lows. He was there walking with you. Oh, a true king will always fight for his subjects. And that's what made Jesus go after them. It says in 16, verse 16, it says, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. I wonder how did they not know their master? How did they, they not know his rabbi? And I looked up at the verse Galatians 5, 25. It says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That means if we're in the spirit, we have to walk in the spirit, speak in the spirit, but also see in the spirit because spirit recognizes spirit. And when Jesus was there, because they were walking in doubt, they were walking in fear. You'll see that later on where he, 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 he confirms that they were walking in doubt and in fear. They were not walking in the spirit. And that is why their eyes were restrained. It wasn't that God hit their vision from him. It was that they were in the flesh. Oh my God. It's like Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den. Every time the gates opened, they, the king had a lion den where he would throw people in there to die. That was their sentence to be death by lion. The lions would eat them alive. And when they threw Daniel, the lions heard the gate. They opened up, the, they opened it up and they heard the clanking of the gates. And that was the lion's signal to know it's time to eat. It's supper time. And they take Daniel, the Bible says, and they toss him in there and they leave him in there. And they're waiting for the next day to see. And when they look down, Daniel is still alive. The reason why Daniel was still alive is because Daniel never stopped praying. Daniel will pray three times a day, the scripture says. So Daniel maintained himself in the spirit. Like the verse says, if we let us live in the spirit, but also walk in the spirit. So when they tossed Daniel down there, the lions didn't see human Daniel. They saw, they saw spiritual Daniel and they saw a realm that they were not to touch. They saw a realm of authority. They saw a dimension that speaks truth. And that's the realm that we need to walk in, in the spirit and the spirit of truth. Amen. Can I get an amen? Oh. And 17, it says, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Jesus is telling them, how can you claim to be a Christian? How can you walk this walk, my walk, but still have doubt? That sounds like the book of James. A double-minded man is unstable. That's like what the verse Matthew 5, 37 says, but let your yes be yes and your no's be no's for whatever is more there is, there is from the evil. Did you get that? Let your yes be yes and your no's be no's for whatever is more than these 
is from the evil one. What does that mean? If you got to give God a yes with an explanation or terms, then God says, keep your yes. Don't tell me yes, I'll follow you, but. Don't tell me yes, Lord, I surrender, but these are my terms. Don't tell me, God, I'll worship you in, 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 in from, from certain times and certain situations, but not all the time. The Bible says if you have air in your lungs, you are to worship God. Amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Dios mío, háblame. <laughs> hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Some people say this is God passing judgment. This verse says, For God is not a God, the author of confusion, but of peace. God didn't pass it. But he allows it. This was a topic I didn't want to get into. God allows it, but he didn't do it. And I don't know about you, but I've seen how God, the gospel, is getting out even more than ever before. I go to YouTube. I go to Facebook and I see all the other pastors Monday through Sunday. Somebody is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not waiting for the temple to be open. People now gifts are starting to be opened up. People's now gifts from the spirit are now being exposed, are being brought out, are being drawn for these times. Because it is for these times that your gifts have been given. You've been sitting quiet for a while. You've been wondering when it's going to give me a turn, when it's my chance. This is your chance. This is your time. Oh, my God. Isaiah 43, 1 says, he spoke to Jacob. He tells Jacob, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name because you're mine. And that's what God tells you. I'm calling you out by your name. I'm calling you out because you're mine. Stop running. Stop hiding. Surrender yourself to what God has been calling you. And in this time, you've been feeling the tug at your heart. You've been saying, I wonder if I should do this. I'm wondering if I get recognized to do this. God is telling you today, yes, because you're mine. That passion that's telling you, that's rising up and leaves you unsteady, that's God giving you permission, telling you. When I say there are talents, there are callings that are being activated at these times. There are creative ideas of how to get the gospel out. They are being activated at this moment during this time because they thought they could shut the church down. You see, the enemy thought the church was a building. He didn't realize that you are the church. This is the body of the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you have the power and the authority of Jesus Christ to speak and preach the gospel and call the things that they are as they are so. Hallelujah. I don't know who that's for, but can I get some hands up that somebody's saying they're receiving this? Oh, in case you didn't know, and I'm going to tell you why things are being activated at this time. In case you didn't know, this was a pandemic that has been going on since the beginning. Since the beginning of time, there has been a pandemic. This was the coronavirus in effect back then. Let me explain. Corona in Spanish means crown, corona. And I'm not talking about the drink, the beer, the liquor. Virus is an infective agent that can only live on the inside of its host. So the problem is there has always been a fight for the crown, the corona, virus, the crown virus. And there's one crown, one crown that is the truth. And there are many crowns that are lies. But that one truth count, crown belongs to one king. The Bible calls him the king of kings and the Lord of Lord. And ever since the beginning of time, since Adam 
even that with Lucifer up in heaven. He wanted to be seated. He wanted to run the show. He wanted to be seated at the right hand of the father. But that seat was occupied. And he had to get kicked out because he wanted that crown. El quería esa corona. And that's the virus. Is that it says here a virus is an infective agent that can only live inside of its host. So depending on what you're letting inside of you, what you're listening to, what you're watching is going to infect you and decide what crown you're going to follow, whether it be the crown of the enemy or the crown of God. Let that marinate for a little bit. What crown are you allowing to live inside of you? They are following the road to Emmaus, the crown of uncertainty. But King Jesus went after his subjects because they were being attacked. And like a true king, he went after them to protect them because the king of kings was walking with them. Your doubt and your faith does not determine if God wants to walk with you or not. Your faith and your doubt does not determine if God wants to heal you or not. Ooh, that sounds crazy, right? No, you got to have faith. If God wants to heal you, he'll heal you. If God wants to walk with you in your doubt, he'll walk with you in your doubt and, and walk with you till you realize that he's the truth. Verse 25, he goes on to say, say to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter and to enter his glory he was letting them know jesus was letting them know that what was walking with them this whole time while they were doubting was a prophecy that had come to pass the resurrected christ so they're waiting to see to confirm that's why they left jerusalem and now they're on their way to Emmaus because they were waited three days to see the confirmation that he has risen. They wanted to see him risen because people came back and told him, told them. The ladies went, they saw the tomb empty and there were angels and the angels told them, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? So even though people told them, they said, until we see it, they still had doubt. Like some of y'all with them stimulus checks. Y'all didn't think you were going to get them. And you opened your account this morning, you sold them $1,200. But it's funny how we put more faith in the government than in Jesus Christ. All I know is I serve the government that's above all governments. The Bible says that all knees shall bow and confess that he is God. That's the king I serve. So Jesus was letting them know that the prophetic the prophecy that was with them walked with them. And the prophetic word, this is, the prophetic word went out to search for them in their doubt. Oh, that's for a mother. Hay una mujer que estaba orando por sus hijos, preguntando, Señor, ¿cuándo? ¿Hasta cuándo? Porque ahora, aunque tenga la ley y él está supuesto estar en la casa, no está en la casa y todavía está haciendo sus cositas. Así te dice el Señor. Ruba sheteli amai, ru kustunduru amai. En la misma forma en cual yo persigue esos dos discípulos, yo también estoy persiguiendo a tu hijo. Y aunque él no me cree y tiene duda, yo estoy andando con él. Y al tiempo perfecto, yo me voy a revelar a él. Y él va a saber que yo soy Dios. Su so, mujer tenga paz. Tenga paz que Dios está andando con, su, con tu hijo. Aunque él no lo cree, aunque él no quiera aceptarlo, él está con él, dice el Señor. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know. I don't know what word God has given you. But in the midst of all this going on, the word is still walking with you. I want to let you know that, that no matter what you're experiencing, whether it be financial problems, 
whether it be health issues, whether you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, you're living not even check by check, you're living day by day. God is still with you. And as long as he is with you, he will provide. Prepare to see the manifestations of prophetic words that have been spoken to you during these times. I said earlier that God in these times is activating gifts. God in these times is activating gifts to show to the world. I heard a governor, Governor Cuomo, said the other day, the numbers in New York are going down. And he's had the nerve and the audacity to say that it wasn't God, that it wasn't faith, that it was because of us and what we did. He wants to take credit for what God is doing. And to me, that's idolatry. That's an idol asking to be worshipped. And I felt pity for him and I felt sad. Because like I said earlier, all knees shall bow and confess that he is God. And this government, the one that some of you are putting your faith in, listen, don't, don't, don't put all your, all your money. Don't, don't try to cast. How can I explain this? Don't put all your eggs in the basket called the government. If you're going to put your faith and trust in something, put it in Jesus Christ. Because he invested in you before you even existed. His death was planned before time. And he was willing to give it up. He invested everything he had. His blood, everything. So that you can be saved. Oh my God. And I'm going to finish. I'm almost done. Sometimes profound uncertainty precedes life-changing faith. Profound uncertainty. I know there's a lot of that going around right now. You're not knowing what to do, what to say, how to act, where to go. There's people trying to find jobs. And they can't. You're risking your life going to the store just to buy food so you can survive. But certain profound uncertainty precedes life-changing changing faith. This whole thing is a setup. This whole thing is a setup. And you shouldn't be, you shouldn't have fear. And you shouldn't be scared. First John 14 says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love cast out fear. Because fear involves torment. Huh. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. If you are fearing, if you are nervous, if you are doubting, I advise you to take this time and get in with the Lord. I advise you to take, take a room, take a place and make it your secret place with God and seek his face. Seek his presence. And you will see the Bible says that he will give you a peace beyond understanding. People are going to wonder. How? How are you so calm during this? It's because I have the peace that supersedes the understanding of man. According to the government, my, my symptoms that I have physically, health-wise, I'm a perfect victim to catch that. But I rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ. I claim the blood of Christ over me and my house. My household shall not have that. And I speak that. And I believe that. That doesn't mean I'm going to be foolish. That doesn't mean I'm just going to go outside and do foolish things. I'm going to protect myself because it's also wisdom. The Bible says, do not tempt the Lord your God. So there's faith and wisdom. And then there's knowledge. Wisdom tells you when to use knowledge. It's a whole nother subject. 
And I'm going to leave you with this verse. Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that all things, not some, not a little, not half, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The Bible says many are called, few are chosen. But I like the beginning part. Many are called. Maybe you're not called to minister. Maybe you're just called to praise him. Maybe you're just called to thank him. Let me tell you something. This, this pandemic. It's brought me closer. It's, made, it's opened my eyes. To be more appreciative. Of what God has done. The fact that there's a roof over my head. The fact that I was able to eat. The fact that I'm breathing. The fact that I woke up. When there's so many people who are dying. <clears throat> no corona. Thank you, God. Because he's going to take this and do it for his good. I'm believing and in anticipation of something crazy. I was talking to Minister Alex and I was like, wouldn't it be something to shut the governors up and the people who are talking, trying to take credit for it? If someone would just go to like a UMD and go in there and just start praying and that everyone in the hospital be healed in the name of Jesus Christ, how would they explain that? I'm waiting for something crazy like that to happen. That's why I truly believe this whole thing is a setup. Like Romans 8 said, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God. And for those called to his purpose. We see a lot in the media, they're saying, pray. Just pray. We see in videos of people in the hospital praying. It's time for the children of God, for the church to manifest and go forth and let the world know that there is a God who loves them. I thank you for your time. I thank you for tuning in. But before we go, I want to say a prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you, Father. I thank you for your mercy and I thank you for your grace. Lord, I ask that you give those first responders strength, Father. Strength to continue. Father, we, we pray for a hedge of protection over them. That through them, Father, your merciful hands touches those people. That they be a point of contact, Father, for miracles, signs, and wonders, Father. And Lord, the same way the virus spread, Lord, that your glory and your healing spread the same way. Oof, that they get infected with you, Father God. The way the virus came in without asking and went inside, Father, and just made home to people and caused death, caused pain. Father, we pray, Lord, that it be an outpour of your spirit Mm. An outpour of your spirit, Father, in the world. And that the government and the officials and all these world leaders, they will not have any anything to explain. They can't play, blame it on anyone else, but they'll know that it is you, God. That it was your spirit that outpoured onto the world and healed, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I declare this. We declare this. And I know my Fountain family is with me declaring this. A world healing. A world manifestation of the children of God. A manifestation of gifts. And I come in accord with what Minister Alex said when it comes to a game. We are only in month four. We are just... Oh my God, if you divide it. We are just starting the second quarter. And I don't know about you, 
But in football, one minute is a long time. We are just starting the second quarter, and we're already starting to see results that it's going down. And I know, and we know, that is because of God's mercy and grace. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for doing so. We thank you, Lord, for protecting your body. We thank you, Lord, for protecting the first responders, the truck drivers, the people delivering packages. Father, I thank you for protecting my wife as she delivers for Amazon, Father. Father, I thank you, Lord, for protecting my daughter as she works at Dollar Tree, dealing with customers and handling. Father, I thank you for protecting me as we deal with people on the road. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I speak victory over you, over you who heard this message, over the congregation, the congregation of Fuente and all <clears throat> all the people of the world, Father, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, Lord, and amen. I want to thank you for tuning in. Empower Beauty, God bless you. Amen. Danny, what's up, Barbero? Mi esposa, Rebecca, como esta? Yo te bendiga. Angela, God bless you. Amen. Jen, God bless you. Man, I miss you guys. Ada, yo te bendiga. Lisa, hello. Sister, he sister hello. Sister, I miss your, your, I miss your worship. I miss your worship. I miss the Fuente. I miss my church's worship. This is good. This is a blessing. But there's nothing like a home-cooked meal. There's nothing like being live. And I want to tell you guys, I miss you. I miss hearing your voice. I miss hearing your laughter. Your laughter. I miss speaking with you guys after service. I miss my fountain church. I miss you guys. I miss my pastors. I truly and truly miss you guys. And I want you to know that I love you. I love you. We love you. And when this is said and done, if I run up to you and I tackle you and we and I hug up and I, we fall on the floor and we roll around a couple of times, like Little House on the Prairie when they're falling down the hill, it's just me showing love because I missed you. I'm like that big dog that's coming that you're like, oh, my God, he's coming. I jump up and knock you down. That's me. So... I just want to let you guys know I love you. God bless you. Um, and have a blessed day.